I'm Mark Scyther, uh, Principal Solutions Architect for PCAI with HP. Um, we talk about bridging that gap from pilot to production. This is our, our interesting conversation. Part of the problem is every week there's a new foundation model, right? Every week there's a new service that comes out that's really compelling and it's hard to under, and I'm, I live the space like every day, right? It's very hard to keep up with it, right? Just the news releases alone, time it takes to sit down and read through that is fairly enormous, right? So it's like people are trying to like, there's a train, right? And they're trying to like throw a baseball at a train as it's driving by and they're trying to hit this car, but they accidentally you know, miss the whole thing entirely. You just can't ever catch it at the right point, it seems, right? And people get stuck in this place of like, they want to do something, but it's like every time they kind of like start to get it, then, oh, this new foundation model came out and it's, or this new capability, it's really interesting. Maybe we should, you know, squirrel. Let's look that way. So I think that's a part of it. The data piece is, I think, an overlooked component of all of this. Every, co every company that I have conversations with is afraid that their data is going to be made vulnerable because of AI. Because somebody puts it into the context of some call that they're making with, you know, whether it's ChatGPT or Claude, right? Or they're going to expose their code because it would take them, you know, two hours to write the code themselves or they could throw it into Claude and have it in 33 seconds, right? People are afraid that they're going to have data that gets exposed and so a lot of times that's a big concern that keeps people from acting on it. And then just the natural time, as I talked about when it, you know, you go about that, when we build this ourselves, I have to make, you know, choices. And it takes time to make all those choices because there's a lot of teams from different business units, right? The data governance people, my development team, my infrastructure team, I have to get all these people marching in the same direction, right? All at once. So that's a huge issue that's keeping it. And this is, Underwear gnomes. Yes. All right, it's my, my, my fans. Um, this is how I feel like, and I've used this before, and I put it in here because I think it's funny. Um, this is how I feel like AI is. It's like, great, purchase AI. And then profit. And it's like, <laughs> okay, but what's the actual work that we're going to do? Underwear gnomes. Underwear Say no more. <laughs> Yeah, I thought, it, I thought it, was, it got rave reviews at the last time I presented it. <laughs> so the conversation has to turn to something, right? And the hardware side alone is not enough because it completely forsakes the software side. And having conversations around models and different models that you can use is, again, only a small part of it because it's not couched in the broader context of the business and what they're trying to achieve. And so I referenced this a little bit earlier, right? You really have to, this is the conversation that you need to start, well, I have to start with my customers, right? Where do we want to do this? How do we want to start to, to stake a claim in AI, right? We can do it ourselves, we can do it in the public cloud, or we can do it with something like PCI, right? An engineered stack, an appliance. And so these benefits, I won't drain the slide because I'm, I really want to get to the demo because I think it's worth saying, um, and I built it. So this is, you know, you'll have the slides for reference. I encourage you to take a look and pepper me with questions later on. Um, but yeah, what it gives you is now, and this is super important, all of those kind of foundational elements are things that we've put a lot of work into. And these are concepts that we started with six and a half years ago before LLMs and ChatGPT and all this was a thing. We were building things on doing more traditional AI and ML work, right? So like broad anomaly detection type use cases, computer vision type use cases, natural language processing, right? Those types of use cases. And we built a platform to support those. And it transitions really well to the LLMs, right? So the backbones that we built to support this, as well as what we're calling the data lake house gateway. And I have a couple of slides on that that I think are, are valid and need to be talked about because that's the component that gives you the data management, data security, data governance piece that a lot of times is missing where it's now how do I have one global namespace where I can put all of my data assets, whether they're S3 buckets or NFS shares or whatever they are, tables in SQL, right? How do I have them all visible through one plane and manageable through one plane and one common access point for those data assets, right? So now I don't have to care about where a particular piece of data is. As long as I know the access point and the file path, I'm good. You get into the gateway after the demo or next? I think I have two slides on it next. Yeah. 
Can you great. What's the uh, what's the circuit here? The three arrows. I didn't make the circuit. <laughs> the shades of blue. That's the best answer I've heard all day. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the composable and extensible? They're for training purposes. Yep. There? And I'm going to get yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll hit that pretty hard too in the demo. Um, so the idea behind essentially the, the extensible piece of it is that we built a, a very opinionated stack, right, of tools that we think are are the best of breed in the market in each of these different places, right? And it's a broad platform. It, scan, it spans from like data connectivity to, you know, like how do we run distributed federated queries, right, against our data to how do we do data analytics with things like Spark or Airflow for like workflow automation and scheduling and stuff. How do we do the data science life cycle of it? So like things, schools like Kubeflow, MLflow, right? Across all of those things, we made an opinion. We took our stance on what we think are good tools. We understand that we probably aren't going to hit everybody's, and people will always have tools that they want to use, like third-party ISVs or other open-source tools. Fantastic. If you have those, bring them. You can bring those to the platform. There's a button that I'll show you in the platform. It says Import Framework. Assuming some of you guys are probably familiar with the Helm chart. So a Helm chart is a big, ugly collection of YAML. It tells you how to deploy something on Kubernetes. Fantastic. There's three or four different places in the Helm chart, all mostly under the easy UA namespace that you need to go and edit to tell it how to interact with the platform. And you can go and deploy that on the platform, right? And you can do whatever you want to the Helm chart around resources and all that stuff. So that's how you can bring external tools onto the platform. The only caveat is that if there's an external tool that you bring onto the platform, you are now responsible for the life cycle of that tool. All of the tools that are on the platform, HPE provides support for. All the ones that come out of the box, we support those. We validate that they work on the platform, and we support them. We're your first call. So that, that gets us to the 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 label on top of that big fat comparison chart that you showed a moment ago, which was engineered system. So one reason people like to see boxes, like you showed initially, is that that looks like a product that you go buy, install. It's not necessarily an appliance that you simply plug in, but nonetheless. Yeah. So tell us how customers buy this and use it, because it sounds relatively complete, and I think that's an important uh, benefit to this, as opposed to a set of ref arcs with three months worth of configuration and yeah. like that sort of thing. That's its biggest advantage, is that it's not a reference architecture. It is a co-engineered and co-developed system that we built mm -hmm. with NVIDIA. Their engineers sat down with our engineers, and we hashed it out. So when people want to ask me, lowly me, right? They say, well, why did you guys put this RAM in it? And why did you pick that hard drive? And why did you pick, like, it was a co-engineered solution with NVIDIA. We were trying to keep costs down and have performance be as good as it possibly could, right? Keeping in mind that cost. And so, so the answer to, better. can I put my favorite RAM in is no. no. Great. Yeah, I like that's, that. That's it. I've had to tell a customer very recently, like last week, I had to tell them that. Um, because that's not the purpose of it. Could we do it? Sure. I mean, just metal, silicon, right? You can put whatever you want in there, but that would take it out of, out of support, essentially. Um, so, God, 90 minutes goes a lot faster than you think. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, so, yeah, this is that, that data lake house gateway that I kind of promised you, right? Yeah. So, this is the idea that you can use and have secure access and use your favorite sets of tools that you want, whether it be things like, I don't know, so Spark, which everyone's familiar with, or Presto, right, which is a federated SQL query engine, right, that we have on the platform that I can show you, right, or use all of your data science to access it. It accesses all of this data that's in these different places, right? So your table data, all of your file shares, right, cloud, uh, so like S3 buckets or S3 compliant things. Right in all of those shares, how do I have them under a single namespace? Right, and so it would kind of look a little bit like this: is that you have your in, and I'll show you this when we get there. You have data sources up here that are available to the platform, and there's a management plane behind it, right, that you can access. And that management plane shows you all of the assets, allows you to add assets, allows you to apply policy towards assets about who can see these assets or not, what can they do with them. Right, and then it serves it up to you through the platform so that you can directly take and use it. And so, you know, if I wanted to take one of these tables and use it in a Jupyter notebook, 
I can do that very easily. I don't have to do anything else after I provision. What kind of notebook? Jupiter notebook. The Jupiter notebook. I know you're familiar with Jupiter. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, because I'm going to show you one in just a couple minutes here. Great. Something that I built. You have them as a service? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This has got to be something that I didn't. I didn't catch because it wasn't here. <laughs> Keep um, so the other piece I think is really important to mention here is that we have what's called our Unleash AI program, which is all of our ISV partners. We validated them to run on our platform. And so you'll see familiar names in here, right? Things like Crew and Able, right? There's all of these different tools that people, because I, I get them all the time. People are like, what about this tool? Can I run that on your platform? We continue to grow and validate this ecosystem of people that can run on our platform, especially as we're getting into this agentic AI kind of world as it is now. There's tools that have done some really amazing work inside of here, like Able is a good example. And so we're bringing on those ISVs into our ecosystem and validating that you can run these on the platform and developing expertise around them ourselves. And then lastly, Blueprints, very important. If you guys are familiar with NVIDIA Blueprints, with our partnership with NVIDIA, right? part of this is that we, we validate that blueprints that they have will run on our platform. right? And so the validation process is, I think, a little bit too onerous because at the end of the day, this is defined with a Helm chart. right? So NVIDIA has, for example, this uh, enterprise RAG pipeline. They have one that's called multimodal enterprise RAG pipeline. And so multimodal meaning that like, it can do images or text, graphs. right? thing is, when NVIDIA built this, this Helm chart to deploy that application, they put every single embedding model, because there's different embedding models for each different modality, they put each one on its own dedicated GPU, right? When you deploy it in a Kubernetes environment. You with Docker, you only need like one GPU. But you do it in Kubernetes, they want you to have 10, right? And so you don't have to do that, right? You can engineer your way out. So I'm negotiating with them to get my own cut of that. Um, but the idea is that you can go to build.nvidia.com, you can find blueprints and things that you think are interesting and compelling. And I talk to my customers about this all the time and say, great, bring that to the platform. You can bring that to the platform. And you can continue to customize and build and develop applications using that blueprint. Those blueprints are kind of like those end-to-end -end customizable like references for what particular use cases that they're finding a lot of traction with in the market. Now we're, I'm gonna go through this very fast. And then I want to get to my demo. I'm going to hope to be there in six minutes. So again, we're getting it. You guys are going to have to edit for me. Mark Scyther, PCI Solutions Architect with HPE. The cloud makes it easy, right? Sure. <laughs> kind of. You don't care about money. Money. <laughs> right? And that, but that's the truth. Because at the end of the day, every single one of these points is something that's true and legitimate, right? People over-provision you resources and they don't pay attention to it, they'll put long running jobs up with no checkpointing, right? And so if that job fails, 10 hour job, it fails in the ninth hour, you lost all that work and you gotta go rerun it again, right? You've got things like the data piece is crazy because no one, it seems in the cloud is a good corporate citizen. And if anyone's ever noticed that, people will always do the worst possible thing that they can do. Hmm. So I've seen people serving static web pages from DynamoDB, like, very expensive storage for doing nothing, mm. right? And people are like, well, why did you do that? I don't know, it looked cool, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so there's not a lot of great corporate citizenship and that extends into people spin up instances and guess what, they never kill them, right? So those are big problems because when you start realizing that like I have an oil and gas company that I met with, you would know them, um, and they said our operational costs are 10 times what we thought they were gonna be. We thought on this particular thing that they were doing, they said, we thought we were gonna spend $1.2 million in the cloud and said it's costing us about $12 million a year. They also said in the same breath that we don't care because it worked. So I thought that was interesting, but not every company is making that type of money where they can just not care about 10X cost over what they thought it was gonna be. Um, and so these are very important conversations to talk about and to have. And uh, this is the only one of these, I promise, right? But the IDC report about HPE's position, right, in this private cloud market um, is very strong, right? For our private cloud, these manufactured AI systems, 
ultimately, and I have a lot of slides that um, they're draft slides, so I couldn't bring them up and show you. I tried to distill into something that I can talk to you about. Um, the other ones I'm sure I'll be able to talk to you about soon if somebody says yes. Um, there's cost savings to be had. Most of the cost savings, it gets better with the larger systems over what you would have, but you can expect to see somewhere between like a 30 and 60% reduction averaging around 45 to 45 ish percent in cost savings over doing this in the cloud. And there are lots of all of the graphics that I have. There's certain things like when you're talking about running a, you know, llama 3.3 70 billion model full bore for X amount of time, right? These are some of the assumptions that we can make. But when you go apples to apples for what it would cost to run these models against this hardware in the cloud versus doing it with us, it always works out in our favor. It works out most in our favor when it's something that you manage inside of your own data center. If you want to do it with like co-location, right? Because you can, we have co-location partners. You can do it there. It adds about a 10% overhead. But there's still lots of cost savings to be had there. And some of the places of savings that like you might not see, especially if you're doing this against like, let's talk, you know, you're going to build it and DIY it and do it yourself. You have to have the teams and the resources to be able to do all of this stuff, right? So from the infrastructure layer, all the way to people who are going to install, configure all the software, you've got to have teams to support each piece of that stack. It can get you away from all that and get you away from the development time that it takes to do all of that. These are, yeah, these are my charts. One of the charts. <laughs> and I have 32 minutes. Probably show you guys 32 minutes worth of a very compelling demo that I built. <laughs> and I am proud of it. So in closing, for this component, this piece of it, uh, fast time to value, complete control over the security, data sovereignty. We haven't touched on that a whole lot, but I am less than 100% sold that all of these companies that are very heavily incented to continue to grow and learn with their models. I'm less than inclined to take their word that my data is not going to end up somewhere downstream in a you know following training cycle. Mm -hmm. I know they come out with those agreements that say they're not going to use my data. There's uh, I think it was today actually I saw I read there's a uh, there's an in inquiry being launched into some of these models and the trading behind them. So it very much better for me to just have it all within my four walls and I know it's going to stay there. It's on this box that I can physically look, look at, see, or it's in a colo. Um, predictable cost. This can be bought, interestingly, it can be bought either CapEx or OpEx, right? So you can do this as a subscription where you buy and then you have flexibility for capacity with GreenLink, right? So with our GreenLink construct, if you're familiar with it, is essentially you can have res like, a, or like reserve capacity, but then you can have extra space that you can bump into that you don't pay for until you use it. So those uh, GPUs, CPUs that aren't turned on until you need them? Or how, where do you get that capacity from? Yeah, like we would put extra capacity on the floor for you. 